This is VLX number 124, Mocked and Flogged. We are in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. VLX stands for Video Lexio Divina, the Patristic Bible Study and Ignatian Prayer Series Online. God give you his peace, and nomine patris, et fidi, et spiritu santi. Amen. God, our Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. In nomine patris, et fidi, et spiritu santi. Amen. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So Father Lapide describes where we are at this point, and he says, This is the last ascent of Christ. It's his last journey to Jerusalem, which Matthew narrates here. From John's Gospel, it is clear that after raising Lazarus, Christ had departed to the city of Ephraim to escape the envy and hatred of the Pharisees. Now from that city, at the approach of that Passover, when he was put to death by the Jews, Christ went up to Jerusalem according to the law. Therefore, Christ's journey took place shortly before his death. And truly, he went up that he might accept and, as it were, eagerly seize the cross and death appointed for him in Jerusalem and prepared by the decree of the Father for the redemption of the world. So tonight, making this video, I'm just in my scrubs, which are my pajamas, and nobody wants to see that. So I'm just putting the Padre Peregrino symbol on the YouTube and the Rumble and the bit shoot. Also been a little bit sick, so you'll be spared my face. And uh, let me know, though, if you like to see this Padre Peregrino symbol or the B-rolls that I often show from just different beautiful things from across the world. I know some people have said that's distracting. Uh, Some people thought I'm I'm, uh, doing that for their entertainment. Really, it's just easier for me when I'm reading off my screen that you don't see me moving my eyes left and right. Um, But today we have a really great day, so I hope you do pay attention to the audio, not the visual of just the symbol of the Padre Peregrino up there. Okay, so here's the thing. Imagine you've been following Jesus all this time. And it's the best time of your life. I mean, really, this is the most thrilling life you could imagine, to be an earliest apostle of the Son of God, walking through the streets and sleeping on boats and watching miracles and living in the presence of constant supernatural grace, grace coming from the fountain of all grace itself, the second person of the Trinity. The first verse tells us today, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside, and on his way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. Okay, so far so good. So imagine yourself as an apostle. Yes, you're poor and tired, but you're in a very popular group with this rabbi, traveling to the most important city of your people, the city of David, that is Jerusalem, and you are with the most popular group in all of Israel now. Not kidding. You left everything to follow him, but it's a thrill. Because this rabbi named Jesus, because he's healing lepers, he's kicking out demons with immediate effect. He's putting the Pharisees in their place. He is departing a divine wisdom that no one has ever heard. People who are paralyzed are literally jumping up. Even the dead are being raised. So again, this had to be the most popular group of do-gooders ever going through Israel. I know that might sound like the Protestant movies I always rip on saying something like that, but you really have to understand the power and excitement of being one of these early apostles before Jesus was arrested really cannot be overestimated. Christ had this cloud of grace that immediately changed people that these silly Protestant movies can't grasp because they have no sense of ascetical theology. But this cloud of grace would have just changed everyone, for better or for worse. Obviously, most people converted. At this point, it's true that everything Christ did in front of these apostles was thrilling for them. I try not to use just really extraordinary adjectives like that, but really at this point, you got to realize that Matthew 20, to be an apostle was thrilling because everyone in Israel, except the Pharisees who were jealous, was seeing um, they've never seen anything like this man. 
And these apostles were quickly becoming the most important followers of this rabbi, who, well, in their opinion, was the most likely candidate to be the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And honestly, this is what most people were thinking. And they were right, but as we're going to see, it's um, a very different, or he's going to be a very different Messiah than they expected. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, remember, Jesus is occasionally even sending these apostles, that's who you're picturing yourself as, Jesus is occasionally sending you on these missions of miracles, not just his own. Sometimes you're getting sent on these missions of miracles. So remember, his power is already flowing through the apostles. You know, for myself as a priest, if I could have one hour like this following Jesus and working the miracles he told me to execute, it would change my whole priesthood forever. Imagine one hour with him and these guys, fishermen, tax collectors, these guys then get three years of total joy and admonition and hunger and sleeping and correction and a front row seat of teaching and miracles, watching and listening to the Son of God. But then Jesus pulls you aside at the height of all this glory and he tells you he's going to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Now remember, at this point, there were already false messiahs who had been flogged and crucified in Israel under the Romans. Did you know that? So why in the world would Jesus say this? Isn't he going to be the Messiah? Now personally, I usually feel tempted to mock the apostles at this point, or rather later towards the end of Matthew's gospel, I feel tempted. I wouldn't do it because they're saints and you can blaspheme the saints, but I feel tempted to mock the apostles toward the end of any of the gospels because they act like they had no idea what had to happen during the arrest of Jesus they appear to not even know at the resurrection of Jesus why he had to suffer so much. And I feel tempted to say to them, guys, how many times did Jesus tell you about his coming torture and resurrection? And you still didn't get it until Pentecost? Or I guess it was a bit before Pentecost, but did they forget? Did they not believe? I think the not believe thing is probably more likely. But let's grant grant them some slack. We're going to get to why in a minute, switch gears for a second, and then we're going to come back to this. The Senate here in the United States is now voting on bringing into federal law that any two individuals can get married. Federal law, any two individuals. And a lay friend texted me this article on Yahoo News explaining this, and he said he believes we're coming to the point that any opposition to this from clergy could land priests in jail. So we're going to shift gears on the imaginative way, but still using the imaginative way. Imagine a priest friend of yours said to you how he would one day preach a sermon at your local parish on marriage, being between a man and woman, and then the police would come and arrest him, and then he would be tortured and killed. And this priest tells you exactly how it happens. I don't mean he says this is a possibility. I mean, before it happens, he tells you exactly what's going to happen, but before it happens. Now, you would think either you're dealing with a prophet in the unitive stage of prayer. Or you would think your parish priest lost his mind. Even if he's a good man, you'd probably think he lost his mind if he tried to tell you exactly what was going to go down in two months. You know, even if you realize persecution is coming for those who teach marriages only between a man and a woman, you would still think your parish priest lost his mind, especially if he brought this up at the height of his ministry when he was popular and doing really well. Or, perhaps you would not want to believe it. And guess what? I wouldn't blame you. So none of this is to say you would be immoral for thinking that a very specific prediction of, say, a priest friend pulling you aside in the midst of living a very successful life, telling you he would be arrested and tortured and killed in very specific ways for teaching unpopular truths on marriage that challenged the false leaders of his day, you just, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that's crazy. So now the big controversy is marriage issues. Back then, 2,000 years ago in Israel, it was challenging the Pharisees on them making up basically their own new canon law. And I mentioned Protestant movies. One more thing on that. You know, Protestant movies make it like Jesus is this hippie and the Pharisees are the traditionalists. But we have to keep in mind, I've mentioned this before, the Pharisees have rejected traditional Judaism of the Abrahamic faith in place of their new set of rules that will only benefit themselves. And that's exactly what is being played out in the hierarchy 
right now in 2022, and I'm sure 2023 if you're listening to it then, maybe 2024. And did you know I'm in contact with an African priest right now who is kicked out of Opus Dei for criticizing the Vatican's open stance promoting civil unions of those involved in um, unnatural marriages. Not kidding. And the Vatican has supported his suspension under Opus Dei. In case you don't believe me, I will link the LifeSite news article. So, you know, these liberals, they really can't rip on that African priest for speaking, speaking truth to power as, quote-unquote, disobedient, end quote, if these liberals aren't going to rip also on our Lord for doing the same thing and speaking truth to power against the extremely corrupt hierarchy of his day. Now, other people will say to what I just said, oh, but they were big meanies back then, and then these bishops you don't like today, they're, they're big softies. Well, yeah, they are big softies, all right, but they lie and cheat and manipulate just as much as the Pharisees, which is exactly why this African priest I'm communicating with was kicked out of Opus Dei and silenced by the Vatican for defending traditional marriage. I'm linking this in the show notes in case you think I'm making this up. And that African priest, he will secure his own salvation with such courage as they lose their own if they don't repent. Point is this, both times, first century and now, it is the hierarchy set up by God, but the prophets are knocking down that hierarchy's sacred cows. And in the first century, it was their new rules. Right now, it happens to be the whole liberal agenda that has influenced, infiltrated the Catholic hierarchy. And that, that's what Christ and Christians have always been in trouble for, is worshiping the one true God and knocking down the sacred cows of the spirit of the age. But back to the events of the Bible today. So, you know, the apostles, they're enjoying this popularity and the miracles, and that's actually okay. I'm not going to rip on that. But when we're tempted to say the apostles were stupid for seemingly forgetting how many times Jesus mentioned his upcoming passion and death, let's cut the apostles some slack because it just seemed impossible for them considering how popular Jesus was and how many miracles he was working and also how much power he had to be captured by the Pharisees and the Romans. You know, don't forget this. Christ seemed to verbally defeat the Pharisees and slip right between their hands as an invincible force every single time. So if he slips through their hands every time, and that is divine power, and it truly is divine power, why would Jesus throw this curveball at the apostles saying, oh, but he is going to get flogged because of these high priests? Didn't he? Well, wait, didn't he just escape them all these times? And as I said, you know, false messiahs, they got crucified. But in this VLX series, we're long past Matthew 16 when Peter already declared Jesus to be the Son of God. And Jesus says he's right. So these apostles, they all know by this point he is the Messiah. He's not a false Messiah. They actually know he is the real Messiah. Do you see why they're having a hard time believing this whole thing about flogged and crucified? Because they still do see the Jewish Messiah as somewhat of a military leader who will buck the Romans. By the way, have you ever noticed that more than half of the apostles are named after Judas Maccabeus and his sons? This is one proof that the Catholic and Orthodox Bible is inspired, and the Protestant Bible has rejected books inspired literally by the Holy Ghost. Why is this a proof? Well, because Jesus and all the parents of the apostles, they all believe in the Maccabees, and that is why the parents of the apostles have named their sons like Mattathias. That's just another way to say Matthew together with his sons Judah, Eleazar, Simon, John, Jonathan. Now, some of those names are in the Bible, but rarely, like, like John and Judah. Other names I don't know of anywhere in the Bible of the Old Testament besides Maccabees that we have names like Simon and Matthew. These are names directly from those heroes against the Greeks who invaded Israel 200 years prior. So why do you think the parents of the apostles wanted their sons named John and Judah and Simon and Matthew? Because they wanted their sons to be the war heroes kicking out the Romans. And by the way, Judas, who betrayed Christ, and then that great saint named St. Jude, you know, he's the, the saint of impossible cases. We have one advantage in English over the Romance languages that we have two different words, Judas and Jude, for those two very different men. But the Greek word for that, Judas, that has the same name for the saint apostle and the sinner apostle. And so does the Spanish like the holy San Judas Tedeo versus the wicked Judas Iscariote. 
But notice in Spanish, both are Judas. It's kind of nice that we have St. Jude in English, and then we call the other guy uh, Judas Iscariot. But the point I want to make is that the parents of the apostles knew Judas Maccabeus tried to free Israel from the Greeks. They knew it was inspired books of the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament then, but they knew it was inspired. They wanted their hero sons freeing Israel from Rome by this point, 200 years after the Greeks, because the, the Romans had invaded by this point. So they named their sons after that. And again, this is why more than half of the apostles are named after the Maccabees. So it's just one of a dozen proofs that the Maccabees is inspired books of the Bible. And you can't say those are Old Testament names everywhere because, again, I don't know of Simon's and Matthew's anywhere except 1 Maccabees. Anyway, back to the text. So the apostles know the Messiah will free Israel. So when he says he will be mocked and flogged and crucified, they probably just want to believe this is the one thing Jesus got wrong up to that point. I don't mean that blasphemously. They knew he was right about everything. Maybe they just hoped this was the one thing he got wrong. Because why wouldn't you hope that for a friend? Of course you would. But the Greek has really serious words here in this last verse of today, Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. And paikai is to ridicule, to make fun of, to mock, to deceive, or to trick. I'm going to give you three verbs Christ says is going to happen to him in the negative and one positive verb. But here's the three negative words. And paikai is to ridicule, to make fun of, to mock, to deceive, to trick. Mastigosai is to whip, to flog, to scourge, or to punish. This is what Christ is predicting is going to happen to him. Again, mastigosai means to whip, to flog, to scourge, to punish. Then we have this word staurosai. We're going to see a lot of that in the last few chapters of Matthew. Staurosai means to crucify a very specific Roman torture that will lead to death one way or the other. Now, if I heard these verbs, whatever the Aramaic translation of these three verbs was, I would not want to believe this if I loved Jesus as much as the apostles did. In fact, I wouldn't want to believe this if I loved Israel as much as the apostles did because they knew Israel needed this Messiah named Jesus to free it from the powers of darkness. Ah, uh, But that is where the last few words of today are so important. I've only read them once up to this point, but this is it. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Did you hear those last three words? All of that mocking and flogging and crucifixion has to be heard in light of the fact that Christ will raise himself by his own power. What does this have to do with the powers of darkness? Well, at this point, the apostles only think of the powers of darkness that they need to be freed of, from, rather, freed from with all of Israel as the Roman Empire and maybe the bad Jewish hierarchy. And they're not totally wrong. But they miss the fact that the bigger enemy is demons and sin. More specifically, de demons leading man to sin. And that is what the passion and death of Jesus will free the apostles and all of Israel who listens, and any Gentiles who listens, who believes in Jesus, that is the slavery they will be saved from. Think of what we say in the Mass, both the Old Mass and the New Mass. In English we hear, it is in dying that he has destroyed our death, and it is in rising that he has restored our life. That is why Christ must be mocked and flogged and crucified and then raise himself by his own power from the dead, not just to free us from sin, but to free us from sinning. Not just to free us from some juridical imputation, but to free us from the demons that seem to make us sin. They do lead us to sin. And we obey them when we don't have the power of the blood of Jesus. Christ is the freedom fighter of our lives, but it's not against humans. It's against those demons that want to drag us to hell. And if we carry our cross... Christ frees us from those demons and brings us to the new and eternal Jerusalem forever with him. Please say in our Father for me, et benedictio deum nepotentis, patris et fidi, et spiritus sancti, descendet super vos, et maniet semper. Amen.